Once again been blessed by God to live through the beautiful season of our Lord's incarnation, His nativity, and our souls rejoiced with the beautiful hymns of Christ's birth, His humble entrance inside human history. In the royal hours of nativity, one of the most beautiful services of our church, we read prophecy after prophecy about the child of Bethlehem. We heard a plethora of very clear, unquestionable prophecies in the Old Testament about the coming of the Messiah, proving the truth of our faith. There is no other faith on earth that can make this claim. The fulfillment of prophecy is the privilege of the Christian faith only, and prophecy cements our faith. Years ago, when St. Gregory Palamas was abducted by Muslims for ransom, and they kept him a captive for over a year, much like one of our bishops in Syria today, when asked by the Agarines, the followers of Islam, if he loves Muhammad, his answer was worthy of a true bishop of the church. No, I don't love your Muhammad. I love the Lord Jesus Christ because there are hundreds of prophecies in the Old Testament about the life of Christ and not a single one about Muhammad, a statement that nearly cost him his life if they didn't love gold more than their prophet, at least back then. The religions of this world, my friends, are man-made, the works of man's intellect. Only the faith of Christ is a heavenly apocalypse, God's revelation to the hearts of men. In the past, we presented a number of prophecies about Christ's crucifixion and resurrection, amazing prophecies about the cross, the nails, the tomb, the vinegar, the sponge, the darkness of Holy Friday, the scattering of the apostles, the thief on the cross, all these events are described in the Psalms and the books of the prophets. No one in this world can accurately pinpoint events that will occur 50, 100 years from now, let alone centuries and even thousands of years. Only God and his true servants can do this. Isaiah 9.2 the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And in the same book, 9-6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful. He'll be full of signs and wonders. Counselor, Paraclitos, one who will bring hope and consolation to his people. He will be called Mighty God. He will do mighty deeds, supernatural deeds, like the resurrection of the dead people, walking on the sea, defying gravity. Everlasting Father, this child of Bethlehem, is the Father of eternity. He's co-eternal with God the Father. This child is the infinite God and He is the source of eternity, so only He can bring us into eternity. He is the Prince of Peace, P 
peace between man and God, earth and heaven. But unlike all other prophecies which capture different aspects and attributes and characteristics from the life of the Messiah, in a book of Daniel, we will see and try to study today an amazing prophecy that pinpoints the time of the presence of the Messiah, the first coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He includes the number of years in this amazing prophecy of 70 weeks, which is found in the ninth chapter of Daniel. And it would be good to read it very quickly, even though it's quite a long prophecy and a little bit dense. I will use the you know, New King James Version, which most of you are familiar with, but then I will use the Septuagint to do the interpretation. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and profit, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublesome times. And after the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm firm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined. But let's examine the events that brought about this prophecy. Now Daniel went to Babylon about 17 years old, and he's been in captivity along with his people for over 50 years. 50 years have gone by and it seems like his people do not have a lot of repentance. Some are beginning to become confused with the idolatry of the Babylonians and Daniel's loving heart is becoming very concerned. Even though he lived very well, he was always in palaces He's not very happy because he's agonizing about the faith of his people. So at this point, he's studying the prophets, and especially Jeremiah, to find out uh, how long is this captivity going to last. And he realized through Jeremiah that this captivity could go as long as 70 years. And Daniel's a, li uh, Daniel's a little bit concerned thinking that this could go, go on for even longer if people do not repent. So now he begins to intensify his prayer, a prayer that I'm sure has been copied by many of our bishops and saints, a prayer full of humility and self-criticism, contrition, this thing that we call aftomemsia. Daniel will assume the sins of his people. He will become one of his people. He will not say, Lord, I have been faithful to you, but please forgive some of our people who have not been as faithful. This is not the way of the prayer of the saints. So here, Daniel in chapter 9, he will begin to really beseech the Lord. And he will say, Lord, we have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we listened to the prophets and even Moses. O Lord, to us belongs shame of face to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. 
Therefore the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name, as it is this day, we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all those around us. Now, while I was speaking, praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yes, while I was speaking in prayer, Archangel Gabriel, whom I had seen in a vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening sacrifice. Now you can imagine the fire of this prayer, the intensity of this prayer, the prayer of Daniel that brings Archangel Gabriel to him. Gabriel receives a command to go to Daniel. And while I was yet speaking during my prayer, behold the Archangel Gabriel, and this is what the angel tells him. Daniel, I came to impart to thee understanding and wisdom, heavenly wisdom. At the beginning of your prayer, I've received the command from above. I've received the word, so I have come to speak to you, for you are a man of desires. Ania epithemion. You're a man with the most holy desires. So I, Gabriel, came to explain to you the words of this prophecy, the secrets of heaven. Daniel was most beloved by God because he also loved God much more than his own life. He was very pure, most likely one of the most pure prophets of the Old Testament. And our loving God treats his most devoted souls and servants, not as servants, but as friends, as he sends angels to announce the secrets of heaven to his friends. Christ told his disciples uh, 450 some years later the same thing. I don't call you servants, but friends. So Gabriel tells Daniel, be attentive to my words so you can gain full understanding of the vision. So even prophets are asked for their undivided attention when heaven speaks. How much more must we pay attention when we study the word of God? Now, a prophet of Daniel's stature and wisdom needs help from heaven to understand the words of the scriptures and prophecy. And some of our contemporary Christians write book after book about prophecy without the prophetic gift and without the necessary presuppositions, only to confuse the masses, often because their prophecies miss the mark. This happens time after time again. And they don't give up after a few years. They'll simply say nothing about their false prophecies, but begin to do new books. The Holy Scripture is not an easy book. There are some simple and easy areas, but some very difficult and obscure areas. And we really need the help of heaven and also the commentary from saying the people of the church. So Daniel loved his people in the holy city of Jerusalem. He always prayed uh, facing west because the point of reference was Zion, the holy mountain, the holy city of God, and more specifically, the temple of Solomon. Then towards Vesper's time, he was doing his evening sacrifice. And this reminds us of the beautiful pre-sanctified uh, pray, prayer, the uh, prayer in the pre-sanctified service when we, ch when we chant, let my prayer arise as incense before you, the lifting up of my hands as an evening sacrifice. So he prayed for his countrymen and he was very concerned about the extent of their captivity. He was rightly concerned because the weak souls could easily lose their faith and fall prey to the idolatry of the Babylonians or the Persians. So he's studying the prophecy of Jeremiah and other prophets about the 70 years of captivity. And in the midst of his prayer, 
and his loving concern, God sends Archangel Gabriel to console him and have revealed to him a much bigger prophecy, a huge prophecy about the true liberation of his people. Daniel was thinking about their physical liberation from the hands of the Babylonians or Persians, and God gives him something so huge. God gives him so much more. He reveals to him the time of their spiritual and eternal liberation through the incarnation, crucifixion, and resurrection of the Messiah. And the same archangel who will visit the ever virgin four, four and a half centuries later, the same archangel is now announcing to Daniel about the first coming of Christ. Seventy weeks have been determined for your people and the holy city for sin to be ended and to seal up transgressions and to blot out iniquities and to make atonement for iniquities and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal vision and profit and to anoint the holiest of holies. Again, I am paraphrasing a little bit by using the Septuagint. I will break this prophecy in uh, a few sections because it is uh, not only long but very dense. So we will attempt to analyze and interpret each section of this prophecy guided by some prominent Orthodox theologians who have worked on this prophecy in the past. Once again, Daniel is in prayer and his mind is on the 70 years of the Babylonian captivity. And after they were transferred to Babylon, about 10,000 uh, people, the higher echelon of Jerusalem. Now maybe 40, 50 years have gone by. And uh, again, Daniel is becoming very concerned. And now Archangel Gabriel announces this great news to him. He makes known to him the time of the coming of the Messiah. Seventy weeks of years, often translated 70 weeks, evdomada in Greek. Yes, it does mean a week, but in ancient Greek, evdomada is a cycle of seven. Today, for example, we say six dozen of eggs. We have uh, the cycles of 12. Uh, the Babylonians, they used in their numerical system the heptad, cycle of seven. The Romans favor number five. Today we have the metric system, so we have cycles of ten. So Archangel Gabriel announces to Daniel that your holy city and your people will see their Messiah, and he's using the Babylonian numeric system. And he says 70 weeks, not 70 weeks, but 70 hebdomades, 70 heptads of years. In other words, 70 times 7, 490 years is the time that your Messiah will become manifest. Again, Daniel was concerned about the Babylonian captivity, and God now reminds him something immense about a far worse captivity, the spiritual captivity of his people. The Babylonian captivity may be over in 70 years, but the spiritual captivity will continue for about 490 years until the coming of the liberator, liberator the Messiah. 490 years have been determined for sin to be ended and to seal up transgressions and to blot out iniquities and to make atonement for iniquities Four synonymous phrases in Daniel chapter 9, 24. Now, how can sin be ended? People all of a sudden will stop sinning? Some believers will become sinless? None of that. Scripture is very clear when it says that no one can live even one day without sinning. This phrase is referring to the forgiveness of sin. The Lamb of God will lift and erase the sin of the world. The debt, the debt of the 10,000 talents, as uh, we read uh, and we hear in the, uh, in the Gospels of Sundays, the 10,000 talents will be forgiven by the merciful Master. And in John, the first epistle of John, 
1 7 we read the blood of jesus christ cleanses us from every sin from every stain in 490 years transgressions will be sealed up and iniquities will be covered and we chant this after the third immersion of baptism when we baptize our brothers and sisters today blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered and this is psalm 31 of david and god says i will remember your sins no more says the lord i will seal your transgressions and to blot out your iniquities this suggests that our sins and all sins and transgressions are written on the heavenly chalkboard and now god says in this prophecy that there will become a time for god to erase all these sins this reminds us of david's psalm of repentance after his sin with his general's wife Bathsheba Lord according to your great mercy blot out my transgression get rid of it erase it the same concept is repeated with a fourth phrase and to make atonement for iniquities Saint John the theologian says that Christ is our propitiation our exilasmos Christ is the atoning sacrifice who cleanses our sin with his blood. Many other prophets talk about the cleansing of sins by the Messiah. Isaiah says, and the Lord will wash the impurity, the mire of our hearts. In his suffering servant, Isaiah says, he will carry our sins and he will suffer for us. He will be bruised on account of us. We will be healed by his stripes. Ezekiel says, I will pour on you pure water and I will wash you clean. The scripture at times speaks about cleansing through the sprinkling of blood and at times through the sprinkling of water. Blood refers to the sacrifice on Golgotha and to the bloodless sacrifice in our divine liturgy. And cleansing with water refers to the sacrament of holy baptism. These prophecies are clearly pointing to the coming of the Messiah. So 70 weeks have been determined for God to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal vision and prophet and to anoint the Holy of Holies. The coming of the Messiah will bring everlasting justification. Justification takes place by the sacrifice of Christ, according to St. Paul in the, in the fifth chapter of Romans. Then we read, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? And in the same chapter, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace. Justification was absent in the Old Testament. No one in the Old Testament went to paradise. Abraham wanted to see one of my days, the Lord said in John 8:56. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and he was glad. So eternal justification will be given by Christ. Eternal forgiveness of all human death. No matter how heavy, how sinister. Peter asked, how many times must I forgive my brother? Seven times? Not seven times, Peter, but 70 times seven. 490 times. So the gates of forgiveness are forever open from God's side. And this represents the objective side of salvation. And here is one of our irreconcilable differences with the Protestants, the sectarians, the born again, and again, most Protestants who interpret scripture according to their intellect. They believe that justification equates salvation. Christ has done it all. So, I believed, I accepted Christ, I believe in his death and his resurrection. I did this at some campus crusade, at some church a few years ago. I became a Christian and now I am saved and I cannot lose that salvation. This is a blatant misunderstanding of the gospel of Christ. About sanctification, we also hear about that in our baptism. 
after the child or the catechumen is baptized, the priest says that you believed, you were sanctified, you were baptized, you were justified. So at that moment, you are justified. If you happen to die a couple hours after that, the same day, for a baby a couple years later, of course you are a saint because Christ reconciled us to God the Father. He is the mediator. And in Romans 5.1, we read, since we have been justified through faith, but there's another chapter here, the principle of synergy, something that St. Augustine talks about when he says, the one who created you without your will cannot save you without your will. The principle of free will. Salvation is guaranteed to any human being from the side of Christ. And yet most people did not believe because their works were dark. And Christ says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how many times did I want to gather you, gather your children like a hen gathers her chicks, but you did not want to. And this is the key, free will. So justification is not the end of the story, but the beginning. Holy baptism or chrismation is the beginning of our salvation and our introduction to the faith of Christ. Sure, he justified us, but St. Paul also talks about the most graphic example of the graft. During baptism, we are grafted on the distinct body of Christ in a very organic way. How organic? Just like a branch is connected on a tree. A branch can only live if it stays connected on a tree, on a tree called Christ. And Christ says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Now, I live as long as I receive the necessary nutrients from the tree called Christ. As a church member, I am alive. I don't do sins unto death. And as long as I am nourished with a medicine of immortality, Holy Communion and Holy Confession are two sacraments that are very necessary to stay alive as Orthodox Christians. So I need to place myself in the right position to have access to God's eternal justification. I believe in His one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, His distinct body, and I live the sacramental life of the Church to strive to develop the mind of Christ to expel all idols out of my heart so I can enthrone the Holy Trinity in the very living room of my heart. And this not for a few days, not for a year or two, not during Great Lent, but every day, on a daily basis, until the day I die. So salvation takes place through this organic connection with his body, his holy church, the only dispenser of his grace. Only the church can provide us with the washing of regeneration and with his body and blood. Furthermore, we're given all the necessary spiritual gifts at our baptism to complete the journey from the image to the likeness of Christ, which is the purpose of our life. Many of us like the idea of being with God, but few of us choose to imitate him in his sufferings. And Archangel Gabriel now reveals to Daniel that there will be a time of eternal salvation, continuous forgiveness, continuous access to repentance and salvation. And God will seal vision and profit at that time. A seal is usually placed at the very end of an ofi official document or decree. So Christ said the visions and prophecies were necessary up to St. John the Baptist. Now, the kind of prophecy that Christ is speaking about here, he's speaking about messianic prophecy. In other words, the prophets of the Old Testament, the Psalms of the Old Testament that were pointing to the coming of the Messiah, these are called messianic prophecies. These prophecies are now fulfilled, and the final messianic prophet a prophet of the present, and the culmination of all the messianic prophets is St. John the Baptizer. He identified the Messiah, fulfilled all righteousness after baptizing the Lord, 
and all messianic prophecies about the birth, baptism, healing ministry, transfiguration, passion, all these have been sealed. There's no need for any more of these prophecies because the Messiah has come. The Jewish people are still searching for their 12 tribes that have been scattered all over the world. And they're still expecting, those who believe, they're still expecting their Messiah. Yet they have seen not a single prophet for the last 2,000 years. For centuries before the coming of the Messiah, from 2,000 years before, we had amazing personalities and prophets almost every century. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Isaiah, David, Solomon, Jeremiah, Elijah, Elisha, Ezekiel, Daniel, Jonah, Malachi, dozens of great prophets and world-renowned personalities glorified the nation of Israel century after century, up to St. John the Baptist. Not a single prophet after the nation of Israel crucified and killed its Messiah. And now this prophecy revealed to Daniel sets a time frame for the appearance of the Messiah. Seventy weeks have been determined to anoint the Holy of Holies, the person with absolute holiness. Seventy weeks, 490 years for the anointed one, the Christ, the most holy son of God to appear. The most holy is christened by God to save the world. Jesus in his human nature was not christened with oil but with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit descended in the form of a dove to christen the Son of Men, the Messiah. And at verse 25 we have the second paragraph of this prophecy which breaks down the time into two, 62 heptads of years and seven heptads of years from the command to allow Jerusalem to be rebuilt. Until Christ the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So this command to restore Jerusalem and the temple, to rebuild Jerusalem, this command historically took place during the 20th year of the reign of the king of Persia, Artaxerxes the Long Manus. 49 years after this prophecy, permission was given to rebuild the walls of the city of Jerusalem. And the funds were collected by the Persians. Now, during the 62 weeks, the second time frame, after that, 434 years, there's really nothing of Christological significance, but the end of the 62 weeks will carve history in two, before Christ and after Christ. The second person of the Holy Trinity becomes the Holy Infant of Bethlehem. And in the third paragraph, and after the 62 week, after, after those 434 years, the Christ, the Anointed One, shall be cut off. The King James says, the Septuagint says, the Christ shall be destroyed and there is no judgment in him incredibly amazing now who can doubt that this prophecy is clearly foretelling the unjust death of the son of god the christ and there's no judgment in him pilate said it this man has done nothing deserving death and his wife procla one of the saints of our church told him have nothing to do with this innocent man Christ also said, the prince of this world is coming and he has nothing on me. The evil one was searching to find a sin, some kind of a flaw on Christ. Now he did this previously with Moses. He was fighting over the body of Moses with another archangel, Archangel Michael, perhaps because Moses killed the Egyptian and, and buried his body in the sand before he escaped from Egypt. But Christ was flawless, sinless, guiltless in all things. So the devil left empty-handed empty and returned to his friends, the scribes and the Pharisees, to inspire them to kill the Lord of glory, to hang their Messiah. And the devil put some horrible words in their mouths 
in their vicious attempt to convince Pilate, who washed his hands to show that he is innocent of this man's blood. Yet these poor, pitiful people spelled out their own judgment at that very moment. His blood on our heads and on our children's head. And now the rest of this paragraph prophesies God's judgment on these wicked servants who put to death the king's son. And we have a prophecy about this in Matthew chapter 21, I believe, about the landowner who rented his vineyard to some wicked vine dressers. The landowner wanted his fruit, and the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. Uh, I believe we read this uh, this parable um, or this gospel actually in the um, during the feast of Saint Stephen, the first martyr. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did likewise to them. The last of all, and la then last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, "They will respect my son." But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, "This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance." So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Prophecy about the death of the Messiah. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? And again, the answer came from the very lips of the Pharisees and the scribes. They said to him, He will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. And here is Daniel's prophecy 450 years before. And after the 62 weeks, the anointed one, the Messiah, shall be destroyed, and there is no judgment in him. And God shall destroy the city and the sanctuary with the prince, prince that is coming, meaning Titus, the prince from the Romans. So since they killed their Messiah, now God will destroy these people along with the temple of the Jews. Since most of them did not repent after Pentecost, about 10,000 repented initially and perhaps 5 to 10 percent. We have accounts of about 40, 50,000 Christians in Jerusalem at that time. And because most of them did not repent, however, the vast majority not only failed to repent, but they continued to persecute the gospel with a vengeance. And now the prophet says that they shall be cut down by a flood, by cataclysmic conditions, a powerful statement to show the unprecedented destruction that awaited Jerusalem at 70 AD. Christ also said, do you see this temple? Stone will not be left upon stone. This is so graphic. Titus literally leveled the entire city, turned it into a farm. And now the archangel turns to the 70 weeks again, and he talks about the last week from the 70 weeks. And one week he shall establish a covenant with many. God will establish a new covenant with many people. And this is reminiscent of the mystical supper. This is my blood of the New Testament, new covenant. And the covenant was established by the death of the coming Messiah. And in the midst of the week, sacrifice and drink offering shall be taken away. The sacrifices of bulls and oxen and sheep shall come to a halt in the midst of the week. Three and a half years, three and a half years of the last week, Christ was crucified after three and a half years of public ministry. And after the true sacrifice, there's no need for all the symbolisms and prefigurements and typologies. The old sacrifices will be replaced by the bloodless sacrifice, and that is our divine liturgy. Holy Eucharist. And we have a wonderful prophecy in Malachi where the Spirit of God says in the first chapter, And I will not accept a sacrifice from your hands, he tells the Jews, 
because from the east to the west my name will be great among the nations. This is telling the Jews that the Messiah is not just for you. Through you, the Messiah will reach all nations. My, my name will be great among the nations, and at every place, incense will be offered in my name. Incense and a pure sacrifice, says the Lord Pandukato. The pure sacrifice is the bloodless sacrifice of the New Testament, our divine liturgy. And now Gabriel turns again to the destruction of Jerusalem. The Roman soldiers were not only hated by the Jews, but they were considered unclean and infidel. So they will, uh, if they would enter and desecrate and destroy the temple, uh, they would call this desolation. And the desolation will go on for centuries up until the very end of time. At this point, I believe the prophet speaks about the hope of Israel. A little before the end, many Israelites who are now unbelievers will believe in Christ. This is one of the signs of the end call a mystery by St. Paul in Romans 11:26. Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the nations has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. In other words, all faithful Jews, all repented Jews who now are believing on the Messiah, all those who believe in Christ and the gospel will be saved at the very end. And this is the end of this amazing prophecy, informing Daniel that in 490 years, the Messiah will enter human history to consecrate a new covenant with the fallen children of Adam and all of us. This prophecy was fulfilled to the fullest. Now, it is not important to exhaust our energy on the chronological details and months and dates We'll leave that kind of work to the chronologists. We mentioned earlier that prophecy cements our faith. And since this prophecy of Daniel and all the prophecies about the first coming of Christ have been fulfilled by mathematical accuracy, then all the prophecies about the second coming, the tribulation, and the final judgment will also be fulfilled. When? We don't know when because a time was designated for the first coming of Christ, but we don't have such a time for the second coming of Christ, although we were given many, many signs. And according to St. Andrew of Caesarea, we will be able to understand these signs if we stay vigilant. The saint said, time and experience will reveal to those who have their vigil lamps lit all the time. Let us pray for much repentance and more obedience to the word, word of God this new year, 2014. Amen. Be perfect.